time won't allow, but I would like this idea again. Yeah. Let me give you an image. Yes, an please. image of you know wh whoever rebels they have. They have code names MRC. They all seem to be dressed and bedecked, and they've got the uniforms. They've got they've got the weapons. Yeah. When you you alluded to it earlier, could yeah. you elaborate on this idea of where does this balance of interaction? What are the forces on the ground that you know more about than we do? Uh, it's, uh, I'm glad you said balance of interaction. In an ideal world, that interaction will be between just solely among the people of that society. So that the sort of conversations, regular conversations that I was talking about earlier, about how we live together, what determines it, what mode of governance, if those happened in an ideal world, then you probably not have your M23s. But what I see from time to time is a situation where the balance of interaction is between externals who have an interest and African elite who have, if you like, sold out on their people and are not very concerned about the day-to-day -day realities of that society, but have their own particular group interests who pre prefer to deal with outside interests to achieve some immediate goals. So your M23s, uh, your, your northern Malis, uh, your, your Nigers, if you like, your northern Nigers, if you like, your Libyas are a function of this. And until Africa comes back to the drawing board to deal with the structural gaps, the structural realities that have led to all of this inequality in society, rampant insecurity and poverty, I don't think we will stop having a situation where external interests take advantage of those vacuums. Right. The, ramp the rampant insecurity. Mm. I, I would have drawn you on the idea of, you know, the, the raw materials in our midst. But let's look about ah, hu yes. hum human beings. Yes. Uh, you are a woman and I'm going to ask you again an image. I'm dealing in images. Yes. The UN peacekeeping force goes through town, rapes the locals. The M23s go through town, rape the locals. Yes. Why are women forever the victims. Does this mean that as a society we have no respect for our women folk? Well, it could possibly mean that. Uh, and I think again, going back to a leadership vacuum, we have focused so much talking about peacekeeping on uh, an institutional, a structured institutional approach that checks boxes uh, about rules and about, you know, who has done what over a period of time over the fundamental attitudinal change, the values and beliefs and the attitudes that underline how people be behave to each other will not stop, you know, will not change whether we're living in the society that has caused war or whether those people in that society put on uniforms to try to help people. If that is what you have learned, if those are the values you abide by on a day-to-day -day basis, the fact that you wear a uniform of a peacekeeping uh, organization or, or, or of a peace organization that has certain rules where you have to check the box does not mean that you will behave to that organization's rules when the back of those who are looking at you, when their backs are turned. So, Doctor, am I, am I suggesting that the change of which you speak is yeah. going to be a global change, which looks a radical rethinking of the way we interact, not just as Africans, Absolutely. but in taking in all races. It has to look at that radical rethinking globally, because I, I, I don't think, let's also not demonize each other. Uh, this is not an African problem. It's a global problem. How men behave to women because that's how they've been socialized, how women sometimes internalize their own challenges because that is the situation in which they find themselves. Until those conversations in society, and I, I, want to, I, I want us to really interrogate this. Leadership, as far as I'm concerned, is not about that individual. It's not a hierarchical thing. Leadership is really about our interactions in society and how we frame you know, the rules and our interaction, you know, the rules that govern us in that space. Until we interact as equals, man and woman, young person, old person, that's, that situation will not change. So you can I'm ask I'm me. Not, I'm not putting words into your mouth. Yes. But I would suggest that you should bring in the word education into your discourse. Absolutely. Because, uh, so, yeah. w w again, as 
an expert on war and peace. Yes. Where does education come in? Education is to, absolutely. I'm going to take my kids. You're somebody's going to take their kids to school. Yeah, yeah. And make the assumption that somewhere in school these values are being passed education on. Education is absolutely central, but this is not a school's thing only. You hope that in schools uh, peace and security will be taught because that's what we have been confronted it over with over the past five or so decades on the continent. It's yeah, not, fast it's forward, not yeah, automatic. But, but you're not, we're not confronting the governments in place. I yeah. mean, it, 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 we've got our new Jubilee government, as yes. you know. Yes. I don't, uh, I've looked at their manifesto. There's no mention of uh, peace and security in our educational system. Well, that's particularly the sort of thing. It's not just your Jubilee government. There are many governments. And in fact, if you look at peace and security and where they're being taught, typically they're now being taught more in societies that have been through war uh, before. If you look at the curriculum in Liberia and Sierra Leone, this is not just a curriculum thing. It's the vision that oversees all of that. It is the influence that, you know, deals with it. So if your Jubilee government uh, does not have peace and security in it, it ought to. Uh, it ought to. And Kenya is not alone in... You know, in this, many African countries have to rethink uh, how uh, all of this... But I'll go back to this I, dialogue. I mean, yes. we Kenyans, or to we, we had our 2007-2008 post-election violence. Yes. We should be the first on the table to say we need to change the way we address our young. I, I, but I'm I, saying in governments, uh, let's go back to our conversation. Yes. I'm saying you and people like you yes. are working at a tangent coming up with a wonderful formula, having disciples, if you will. Yes. But these disciples, unless they become politicians in their own right, unless they become the MPs and were part of the African Leadership Center, but our life remains the same. I would say you so to a point. have pious man living in the hills, praying, absolutely, spiritual, absolutely. and he's the only one. He might as well be in a monastery. Sh shall I give you part of one of the theories that we deal with? Leadership and excellence. They go hand in hand, but they could either work positively or negatively, okay? So many African leaders are talented and they're very well networked. The point of the African Leadership Center is that we argue that in this current generation of people and especially in the future generation, we have excellent minds who, with the right values and with the desire to transform their societies, they can actually then be your politicians, but we're not just interested in the field of politics. Right. Because leadership is to be found across the board. Poets, writers, educators, who will take over uh, the different, you know, the, the ideas uh, that shape the institutions and hopefully transform those ideas to transform those institutions. And therefore, your Jubilee government or any other government in 15, 20 years time will look different and will think differently about the challenges of the society. Without that happening, we cannot begin to see any change. So you and I are probably agreed that there's not much difference at, at the moment. But that's what we're working towards. Which leads me to my final question. Okay. Uh, it's where, where we started, we've gone in a circle. Yes. Uh, having talked about what we have, yeah. is there an end in sight? Is there a timeline for change? Or uh, are you going to be in employment to the rest of your academic years because <laughs> the problem won't go away. I wish I could be really, really optimistic. I think there's potentially an end in sight, but that end is not very near given the trends that we see on the continent at the moment. That leadership vac vacuum persists. But the, the, the point of optimism for me is that the African Leadership Center and organizations like this who despite all of the negative developments uh, that we see on the continent, we still see some bright lights. We see some positive de developments and we want to try to harness all of that that is good in the people, in the approaches, and see whether we, we can generate a critical mass that begins to, uh, from country to country, transform the debate and transform the continent of Africa ultimately. It's a long journey. We cannot put a particular timeline on it because we also do not know when externals can come in uh, and circumvent uh, that, you know, that pathway. But it's our job, it's our continent, and therefore it's our job, it's our task to try to transform the debate and the continent as a whole. Dr. Funmi Oloni Shakin, Director of the African Leadership Center, thank you so much for coming. Thank to you. Jesse.